Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome to Tech Leaders Hub. My guest today is Alvaro Moya. Alvaro, how are you doing today? Thank you, Jacob, for my opportunity to be here in this um, in this podcast. Uh, really great, to be honest. A bit overwhelmed, but I'm starting to go uh, into the summer vibes uh, with uh, the yeah. recent openings of the of the province here in Barcelona. So uh, yeah. heading to my favorite beaches and so on. Great to disconnect. So. Yeah, things are slowly, slowly opening up here in Poland as well. So it's a very optimistic time. And it's a time at which I think a lot of companies might be thinking about scaling. We're scaling, for example. So this topic, I think, is really relevant for today. Uh, a few, you know, a little bit of housekeeping first, just to make sure that we're all on the same page. If you can see us and if you can hear us, please leave a comment wherever you're watching. Some of you are watching on YouTube. Uh, some of you are watching on LinkedIn, probably. Leave us a comment. Let us know this is all working correctly. You can hear us correctly because nothing would be worse than, you know, recording this in some sort of bad way in terms of, you know, technical issues. So let us know. Other than that, we're going to give people just a minute to join our conversation. In the meantime, Alvaro, who do you hope is joining here? Who will benefit from our conversation? I think um, early stage CTOs and first time CTOs uh, are really going to get the most out of this session because it's kind of recommendation for them to grow the team once it is uh, it is starting to it is starting to grow also for middle middle managers already like engineering managers uh, that has been in the role for for quite some time can be really valuable to have experiences from 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 uh, other perspectives so this is more or less the role i am expecting here to to join Excellent. Hi, everyone, and I see, by the way. Yeah, a lot of people are joining in, so that's great to see. I just showed some of the comments that we're getting here. So so that's great. That is really, really good. OK, so let's give a, something special to the people who just joined us. And what I like to do is to give some value from the very, very beginning of these sessions. When I watch these sessions, they take a while to get to the point. Let's start with something valuable right from the start. So my traditional question, Alvaro, what is your number one tip for tech leaders? My number one tip would be being prepared to learn and adapt. Hmm. Someone flexible today in the world we are living in, it's the hmm. most valuable skill you can, you can develop. So say yes to everything, take everything as an opportunity, as a challenge to learn, even if it's tough times, this will make you stronger. And it's everything about getting different contexts. So for the new uh, challenges you face, you will have something, something to get uh, to the context and then apply it. Yeah, be open to learning. I think the people joining in, spending some time with us to learn new things, they're definitely open to learning some new things. So you know, you're taking that step already. Great, thank you for the tip. And that's another one to my collection. And I'm, I'll be asking all of my future guests about this as well. Very well then. Uh, so let's give the listeners and watchers, especially those of them that don't know you, uh, a little bit more background about you. Could you tell us your you know, origin story? What are you doing now? You know, what's your role now? How did you get to this place? You know, wherever you want to start is fine. Okay, how many minutes I have? <laughs> no, I'll I'll stop you if it's getting too too long. Okay, is, now yeah. I will I will try to do this kind of elevator pitch. So in a nutshell, sure. Telecom telecom background. So I studied telecommunications, but get in love with uh, computer science and development all the time. So I didn't uh, do anything related to telco. Starting as a developer R and D in the university, then growing in a company like Coca Cola, not having oh. the opportunity to lead. That was my dream. I was very clear about my, my mission. I, I, I was really clear about that. So I had the opportunity to start a, a tech startup with, with some friends. So I just say bye. I get my savings. Uh, and then I started my first tech company. Um, and from that point on, like creating the CTO role for myself, being a, a CTO that was leading just himself without a team, so this kind of co-founder. Uh, then I started to grow in the role with uh, more and more people in my team, not only in the same company, but jumping in different companies, different industries, eventually moving here to Barcelona from, from Madrid six years ago. So I have finally done the whole path. And what, what I want to, uh, what I like to mention it is like uh, from zero to unicorn. So 
starting from oh. scratch, doing everything from the logo type to setting up the domain um, in the company to leading a team of 60 people, distributed remote team in a, in a, in a big company that is already uh, valued at more than 1 billion, right? So this has been my path in the last eight years. And right now, since July, with, uh, with leader, trying to train others to be that great leader in tech that the startups and scale-ups need right now in order to grow the teams because there are a lot of development the development boot camps and, and developers joining but who is taking care of the people that will manage those teams to grow seamlessly to grow um, organically to keep the culture uh into the team so respecting mm -hmm. the values and, and and acting all the time according to the company values this is not something that is so mainstream as the development boot camps. And that's why uh, Leader is, is, is here, Leader existed. I have I faced that shortage of this middle management layer all the time. And that's why I was, I was trying to change something in the ecosystem. Okay, great. Yeah, so, you know, a person that literally trains tech leaders is a great guest to have on Tech Leaders Hub. That's all great to hear. And I think you compressed that, you know, nicely. Uh, all right, so let's try and get into the topic at hand. And by the way, if any of you watchers and listeners are uh, wondering, you can ask questions, go ahead and do that. You know, as we're speaking, we'll try to address them, you know, as we go. Uh, Alvaro finishes a thought and then we'll get to one of the questions. This is pretty free form in terms of the agenda. We have a few big points to hit, but this is also a place for you to ask your questions about scaling. So feel free to do that. Do not hesitate. Let's dive into the subject then, you know, of all these tech leaders that you have, uh, that you're in contact with, you know, either through, through mentoring or, you know, you've had an opportunity to contact with, uh, to get in contact with them through your career, you know, how often does a scaling problem come into the picture? How common is this? As often as a company growing from a startup to scale up. I, mm -hmm. I would say everyone is, is facing this, this problem because at that point in growth, the most important part is that the product meets the expectations of the new stakeholders. Mm -hmm. You meet the demand of the market that is already growing and you are using that fund to grow, to penetrate in new markets. So there will be so much work to do related to the product that at the end, even if you have this continuous learning, continuous development mindset and you want that for your team, Things will pile up and at the end, this topic will be out of the top three priorities. That That's systematic and, and, and it's a problem of the lack of resources and the lack of time. So um, I think mostly everyone growing face this problem because in the early stage market validation part, you are focused on validating the market. So exactly. the transition is sometimes, and I, I would say so often, so fast, from, from being validating to being growing and scaling that the team and the people are not able to grow as fast as, 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 as a company. And that's one kind of comparison that, that one really good friend of mine and, and leader mentor Alvaro was, uh, was doing. Like, this is the growth phase that can have a company, right? In the early yeah. stages. But the person, the people can only grow linear Ah, right. linearly. Okay. We, we we cannot have this uh this uh, hockey stick in terms of how much we grow as 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 people, how much we get the knowledge, how much knowledge we get, how much things we can practice over time in order to get prepared for the new things. We are not as fast as a company can be. The developing a digital product and put it in in front of millions or potentially billions of customers, right? I see. That's a problem. Yes. Yeah, that, that sounds like a real problem. And now, you know, what's the first step towards addressing that? Because, you know, usually I would ask a question like, how do you know you have this problem? But I feel like a lot of people are going to know, right? So let's get right into, you know, part of the solution. How would you start approaching this? What's the, you know, what's the way to address this uh, linear scaling issue here? Yeah, first of all, it's self awareness, I would say. I mean, not everyone mm. is reflecting about this concept of, the people growth not matching the product growth. So okay. the more the more aware you are about it, the the better the solutions you will put in place and the sooner you will put them. Right. So that's the first topic. If you are starting to scale, 
then the best moment to think about scaling your team and start training your team to be those uh, th those leaders that are going to be the second layer in your team. The best moment is yesterday, and then uh, the new best moment is today. So first is uh, self-awareness and, and starting as soon as, as you see the market and the strategy that you are delivering or developing with your team. It's talking about growing. And you see okay. that it's okay, extreme growth, extreme changes in the product, uh, penetrating a new market, so uh, personalizing or customizing the product for new markets. As soon as you see that, you need to understand that that growth will involve growth in your team, in the headcount. Okay. And in order to grow, the best thing is to start preparing that layer. And the next thing would be, hey, I am aware that I need to grow this middle management layer then where I can find those profiles. So the first thing you will do, it's like checking inside. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and you can spot those people that have more like um, um, uh, informal leadership. They have kind of soft skills. They have uh, communication skills. They can understand mm -hmm. the business better. Maybe they, they co-founded a company in the past or they were working as a freelance, right? Because freelancing also give you this kind of overall vision of, of what is a business, uh, yeah. talking to customers, uh, selling yourself, right? So this kind of things works pretty pretty well. And this is the, the first thing I would, I would do in order to grow. Later on, if there is not enough in your team, I would look outside. But if there is someone in your team, then start putting the measures to train them properly by the time. Uh, so involving them in projects with you, start delegating some things related to leadership, um, proposing those informal leadership uh, actions that you, they can take not only into the company but also outside the company so mm -hmm. they start growing even if you are not putting an official or formal learning and development path for them they start doing that and for sure before that you need to ask them if this is the path they want to follow for sure okay so as I understand like the first stage here is to look at your current team and who among those people can be kind of elevated to become part of this this middle management layer, right? So I was wondering, you mentioned a few things that are signs of this informal leadership, but maybe some people don't have a freelancing past or they didn't, you know, take part in a startup. How about they've just been, you know, working at your company or some previous companies before that? What additional signs would you look for to, you know, to think, okay, maybe that's a person to have a leadership conversation with? I think you can feel it. You mm. can feel if someone is really, really in love with just getting in touch with the code, being there, fixing, uh, fixing the code, developing new, uh, new ideas uh, and, and delivering or they have something else. And what I, what I really recommend is that if you don't know already for your team, then maybe the hiring process was wrong. This is the first thing I recommend leaders to do in the, in the, in the hiring process, in, in the cultural fit. What do you want to become? How can the company help you to grow in the direction you want for you? So okay. then you see the match and if there is not a match because you want an individual contributor, you want a pure developer for the next five years because you think so, and the person thinks that it's time for him or her to grow as a leader, it's, it's better to be honest that, that, than wasting the time and energy for that person and also for the company because later on you will need to replace them. Right? So mm -hmm. being honest at the beginning, asking for the, 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 the goals of, of that person in the long term will help. And later on, if you are close to the team, you will see those patterns. You will see those behaviors that can tell you if someone is taking the ownership of a team, if is taking uh, this informal leadership role, it's uh, really leaving the values of the company and trying to transmit them. So mm. it's indirectly or not voluntarily helping you to do part of your work, right? Okay. Being, a, being a speaker, being a kind of a replication of yourself into the team that Keeps them, uh, keeps them motivated, keeps them aligned with the goals, keeps them aligned with the values. It's really making the, the place, the, the environment uh, continuously better. It's proposing, it's proposing things, it's coming with solutions, it's speaking up in a, in a discussion. It, they want to have 
that ownership. They want to have that decision-making power. These are the things okay. I would look for. Okay, so that's... This sounds to me like a proactive approach from them, basically, right? That they're not just waiting for you to yeah. tell them something, or but they just come to you with potential solutions. Yeah. yeah, and it's interesting what you said also that, you know, if you're hiring right, you should already know this about some of your people, right? That uh, you, you may have already asked them uh, at that point, if I'm understanding you correctly, uh, you know, where do you want to go, you know, in this role? How do you want to gradually... Uh, grow yourself. Am I understanding that right? Yes. Um, I'm starting from always, I'm starting from self leadership. Everyone should be able to lead their own lives. Self leadership. And self leadership is for okay. personal leadership, but uh, you need to live your own life before leading others, mm -hmm. right? And uh, you need to lead your own life even if you are not leading others, but you need to know where you are going. Otherwise, it's like taking a bus and you don't know which is going to be the destination, then the companies will go, will, go, will be um, driving your career, will be um, modulating your skills, and you will be training that skills that are needed for the company at every certain stage, which mm. can be great, but at some point, if you don't take action and you don't take the ownership of that, maybe you arrive at a completely final destination that is completely different than what you were thinking for your life, or you were not thinking at all about that. So that's why I start with self-leadership and asking them, what do you want to do? How do you see yourself in two years? How is going to be your life? So you look for roles, you look for places that can be aligned with the lifestyle you want to have and not the other way around. Okay. Yeah, that all sounds very interesting. And this idea of self-leadership, that's something that I'll personally be digesting, I think, for a little while after this, because uh, that's really inspiring. Okay, let me try and get you know even more concrete about this process, because I'm seeing this as a, as a kind of you know story that we're unfolding here. We looked at our team. Uh, we see these people uh, with these leadership qualities. We've identified them, you know, through their daily work, they've given us those signals. So now you mentioned a few things about starting to delegate tasks to them, but what I'm curious about is, is there a conversation that you have at this stage or should there be a conversation like, do you give them a clear signal that I see a potential leader in you, I'm gonna start delegating more to you or do you let it happen more organically or what would, be, uh, what would your approach be here? So if the conversation in hiring a stage and then at the beginning in onboarding is clear, that person sure. should be aware that at some point he, he or she would be leading teams. So sure. it's as easy as, okay, the time, is, the time is now. We are going to prepare you, but the time for the company is now and we would love to have you on board in this new role. And we will make the transition smooth for you. And I will, I will be by your side to make it uh, effective, right? And efficient and you don't get burned out and you can keep uh, your, your, your work-life balance, right? If yes. that's not the case, then in that conversation, for sure, it has to happen, uh, no matter the case. But in that case, then what you, are, what you are telling is like, hey, we see this potential for you, as you mentioned. We see this potential. We want to make sure that this move for you will be meaningful and you mm -hmm. are willing to take this. This is what, it, what I have for you in case you don't know about the role. This is what I have for you. This is the potential impact you can have. This is how it's going to be uh, looking or clarifying how it's going to be the role so the person can have everything at hand to decide, all the cards on the table. So either they decide to go ahead or either they decide to keep at the same role, right? But okay. that conversation should happen from my side. It is a must. I see. So what's at the back of my head then is we mentioned a few minutes ago that this CTO in this situation is very pressed for time, very focused on the product. So what would you say to a CTO that says, I may not have the time to have these conversations or I may not be able to promise this additional support because I'm too busy with the product? What would you say to them? First, uh, that's the reason why Leader was born because we as CTOs didn't find the time and didn't find the right partner to do it. So mm -hmm. first thing, this is what we are trying to solve in the market. So we are here to help and we are delivering plenty of resources so they can do it 
in a way that doesn't that, uh, doesn't mean a lot of time from them. But at the same time, they can follow a process, they can follow a framework, as I have mentioned, for example, from cell leadership. So giving the possibility to their teams to understand what they want. So we have templates for that. So you can have just the conversation with them or just delivering the, man, the, the material and then holding a one-on-one -on -one conversation, which is something you will have already. Okay. Uh, if this is not part of your agenda, then uh, I think something is failing. But uh, instead of tackling another topic, it's like, okay, for the next one-on-one, -on -one, please prepare this, this content. And then you have the visualization exercise, for example, to think about the life in two years. You have the, the mentoring guide so you know what they want to achieve and which is the milestone that they are setting up for themselves. So it's kind of the performance review, but uh, raised race to a new level. So this is mat material and templates and resources. They can they can use it to leverage these kind of conversations without lo and not a lot of time. If they still don't have the time, we are here to help. So we can be this kind of uh, learning and development partner to do it, right? But I think there are plenty of resources, even if it's not uh, from leader, there are plenty of resources uh, out there. And the only problem is that maybe they are not grouped. Or, or, or you need to understand that they fit your culture and the way you want to manage your team, the way, the way you want them to, to develop into the company. Uh, and this is what we try to make sure at, at Leader, that we just create the philosophy of everyone, the mindset of mm -hmm. everyone approaching the community and the resources. And in case there is a match, then you know that everything that you will find here is, is for you because we are, uh, we, we are following the same approach of putting people first which is the uh, kind of the mantra for us. Put your people first because they are the people that matters. They will create the product. They will make the most difficult decisions and they are the reason why you are here. Je your impact will be measured by their impact. So put them right. first and then make them grow according to what they want to and not according to the company needs, right? So exactly so it's also a bit of a mindset change here right to think about not just my impact on the product but everybody's and then you might be looking at your people a little bit more so what i'm hearing is that you know using leader your solution might be one way to go right because you have these materials these mentors organized in a neat way that all i get but let's assume that this cto maybe doesn't know about leader or maybe doesn't you know want to go down that path is there any advice you would share with them of how do you start elevating your leaders if you want to do it yourself? First, um, I would say gather help from HR. I think mm -hmm. uh, it could be a point in time where HR can have uh, resources to help you. First, with budget. Second, with kind of um, identifying these kind of things into the, into the team or delivering time from HR so they can have this kind of coaching or mentoring sessions with the team to understand where they could be into the new team organization with this middle management layer. Um, second, there are a lot of things that the team can do by themselves because the, the, the skills you want to develop in them, it's all about soft skills. So okay. soft skills, as I mentioned before, you can delegate. You can do, uh, as you do per programming, as, as, as a great practice to, to onboard junior developers into the code and, and to uh, follow the best practices from the senior developers in the team, you can do per leading. So you can invite them to be in your, uh, in your decision boards. You can share with them the issues you are facing. When you have to make a decision, maybe instead of doing yourself with your thoughts, your notes, you can invite them so they can be the sparring for you. So they understand which is the decision you are trying to make, which is the decision process you are doing, which, is the, which are the pros and cons you are taking into account. And this way, they will be learning by doing. They are not taking uh, the, final, uh, the final action. They are not making the decision, but they are learning from the inside how it's done. It's not about mm -hmm. watching a video on YouTube or Coursera or watching a blog post. It's about being a real decision in the company. So the more you can involve them in the real framework, the more they are going to learn. Forget about theory. Put them into practice as much as you can. And, and here we follow a process at Leader for, for, for our programs. And this is what we follow in the companies. 
which is this kind of uh, Japanese concept that is called suhari, that is coming okay. from the from the martial arts. So it's like the path to mastery start by just doing or replicating what others are doing and, and teaching you. So it's this kind of teacher stage where you just obey the rules. They are telling you to do something and you do it and that's it, right? And then okay. slowly you are moving to a place where you just not follow the rules, but you start to understand the theory behind, the frameworks behind, for example, for, for making the decisions, you, 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 you start to understand the context and then you start to break the rules. And okay. only in the final stage in, in read uh, from Suhari, is when you really make your own, because you have such knowledge and experience in that field, in that topic, that you can adapt any kind of framework to your own needs. And it's when you start customizing it to your, to your own needs. This can happen with a Scrum, for example. At the beginning, you start practicing a Scrum, like, yes, sir, whatever you, whatever a Scrum framework says, you apply it. Yeah. Then you start breaking, uh, you start breaking some rules because uh, they are adapting better to your team. And finally, you are making your own version of Scrum based on your own needs because you are already mastering it. So this kind of example can be applied as well to leadership. And this is the best way to involve someone in a project. It's not about giving a 100-page book. It's about, yeah. hey, come with me. See what I do. Right. And then right. ask, ask me questions. Or I will ask questions for you so you reflect. I have my own answer. But let me know what would you do. Exactly. So you you are you are practicing even if your decision is not the final one that is made, but you have the opportunity to really be in charge, feel the pressure of having to decide, feel the pressure of where I can gather information to make the decision, but you have someone to ask, you have someone to reflect, so you don't need to take to to make that decision on your own. And the second thing is that the, the stress levels are lower than in the real moment because you know sure. that whatever you decide is not going to be the final decision. So these kind of processes helps a lot. So think about every everything that you can do with more people and wow, put them. It. That is a great framework. And another thing that I'm adding to my list of concepts from this talk, you know, next to self-readership is this pair leading concept that's really intriguing. You said a few things about you know asking questions, and here it is, our first question of the day uh, from David. I think he gave some context in a previous comment, so let me try and read the entire thing first. Uh, so the people listening to this, you know, they might, uh, you know, they will be able to to know. So I'm gonna do a little bit of reading now. Just so David says, often tech senior profiles get pushed into responsibility roles and become overwhelmed and overbooked by process. PPT, XLS, and, and calls. Then they end up not being as productive or motivated as before. PPT, XLS, okay, so these are PowerPoint presentations and sheets. Yeah, I know a thing or two about that. <laughs> so the question then is, how can we avoid this? Is tech leadership different to old school business management in terms of tools and responsibilities? Should tech leadership be completely removed off of hands off the de development? So that's a lot. How would you start addressing this? Now it's it's clear it's clear. So uh, you have a context. I think the context is okay. You are offered or you are directly thrown into a new tech leadership role, depending mm -hmm. on the culture of the company. This is what I was mentioning before. Uh, it's not the same to be pushed into that to be asked to be there, right? So uh, imagine you are you are pushed into, you are forced to do that, and then you will start to have this part of processes, one-on-ones, presentations, uh, budgeting in Excel files, and, and, and planning uh, long-term, whatever. Then, yeah. Uh, yeah, they are not as productive or motivated because they still have part of the role of being a developer or a senior developer or something like that. So how can we avoid being overwhelmed and being burnt out in just one month? So saying, I don't want to be a manager now, and I will never want to be a manager because that experience has been awful, which is something that is happening, unfortunately, for many people. And people mm -hmm. that got into the role, and even if they know that they have business skills, communication skills, and they, they, could, they could sign, they don't, want to do, they don't want to do the extra effort, but just because they had a bad experience and they think every single company out there is going to be like that. And at the end, you can really enjoy and you can get in love with this management role if they 
bring you and they onboard you as they should do. So in this case, in order to avoid that, I would say the, the previous concept of uh, um, pair leading, so doing it progressively is, is going to work. It's like a video mm -hmm. game. You cannot start in level 60. You start in level one, level two, exactly. a small, a small, uh, a small challenges, uh, big rewards at the beginning. So in one shot, you go from level one to level four, you have money to buy more things. So this is for me the way to grow any single skill or in any single role, you need to have someone backing you up and you need to feel safe. The first thing mm -hmm. is psychological safety. If I fail, it's okay in my first time. If I have that, it's okay in my first time, I will have this person and this person and this channel because they tell me, they told me that this is the way to, to contact. I'm going to have these regular sessions with someone. You need to feel safe. And 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 someone, if if, if your time is allocated by someone else, mm -hmm. that person should be conscious that your time is exactly the same that it was one day before. So if your company, your manager, is assuming that you still have all the responsibility and you have now to be onboarded in new responsibilities to learn, to start taking uh, more, more meetings, to start uh, reading much more documentation, these PPTs, these Excel files, that's time and the time is finite. So if they are not doing anything to help you with that transition, it's not time, it's uh, training. It's uh, coaching, mentoring to be there by your side during the process. Is doing it uh, slowly, then is that the right company for you? Because for me, is that old school? Doesn't that, that doesn't mean that it's only relevant to tech leadership. Mm -hmm. That old school practice, and it's another way of leadership. Is 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 much more command and control. It's like uh, swim or sink. We launch you there to the pool, yeah. and if you yeah. swim, it's okay. If you don't swim, it's okay as well. I don't care. That's another way of management, but it's not specialized of tech leadership roles. It's just the culture of the company. So if you find that, maybe that's not the right place for your own culture. If you think that this is wrong and this is weird, and it could be another way to do it, and it's as common sense as the things I have said before, maybe yeah. that's not your place, right? Okay. So, you know, some. I feel tempted to switch the perspective on this question a little bit because. I would agree if I find myself in this situation and, you know, I was just a developer, I was spending, you know, hundred percent of my capacity writing code. And now, you know, my manager is expecting 130% from me, uh, then that that's something that's wrong. Right. But let's imagine, you know, I'm the manager, I'm the CTO. How do I make sure that this healthy balance is preserved? Is there like a ratio of, okay, from now on you're 50% leading or training to become a leader, 50% you're still coding. How would you structure that to make sure that this person is not overbooked, not overwhelmed? Yeah. Again, this is something that is progressively changing. So at the beginning, mm -hmm. when you are a developer, it's 100% zero. Then when you are getting to a team lead role, which I would say is the first step in the ladder, normal, normally you will find that they tell you like 70, 30 or 80, 20. I think it's more, more or less like 70, 30, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's the first step. Then when you grow to the next step, and I would say kind of engineering manager, for example, at that step, you have different team leads running different teams from the inside. At that point, I would say is the right moment to say it's not 0% not hands-on coding, right. but for sure you will not be contributing to code. I would say, mm, as, as much as 10 or 20 percent and not directly right. related to developing your own your own your own functionalities into the code and being part mm -hmm. of the sprint but maybe doing pull request helping the team mentoring other junior developers can be can, can be something that you can do but definitely if you are employing 80 percent of your time managing it's useless to be in the daily uh, ceremonies of scrum for example Mm -hmm. checking all the complexity of the Jira board with all the tasks, then being in the ceremonies to assign, to plan, to estimate, when you need to, to, to manage a team at maybe uh, 20 people, only the one on ones of these 20 people. If you want to focus on a strategy of the business and the strategy of the tech team, and you want to hire people and you need to be in that hiring process, that's more than 80%. 
So the companies mm -hmm. need to understand. You need to be aware of that. When you go from team lead to engineering manager, there is a point where it's purely management. You need to get the time to think about what you are going to communicate. You need to inspire them. You need to get yeah. all the information from the upper levels and being able to transmit properly to the team so they get inspired, they get motivated. You need to assign responsibilities, discuss uh, technical design decisions with them. Mm -hmm. That's everything you are going to be in tech. It's more from a systems design, I think, uh, uh, perspective, more, for, more, more from maybe data modeling because you are modeling a new database or, or you are uh, planning a migration from, from monolith to microservices. Is this part where you will be involved related to tech, but not in coding it? Okay. That's for me the approach. And I would repeat it, I think, over the session, but this depends on every single company. If you don't find that they are doing like that, and, and maybe the engineering manager is something that is still hands-on, it could be. I mean, every single company uh, is working on their own terms, and that's why there is so uh, such a lack of clarity about the different uh, elements, the different roles in the career ladder. And that's why I think one of the resources like uh, the James Stenier career ladder, I, uh, we, can, we can share the link, um, comes as a, handy, as a handy resource. Because okay. at least you have a framework. You know, based on several studies, based on what other companies are doing, it's kind of, OK, who does what and in, in mm -hmm. the different areas. So for a team lead, what is expected from me in terms of code, mentoring, business, um, uh, talking to stakeholders, uh, being in the hiring process, what is expected from me? And you will see in this career ladder how more and more things are related to soft skills and management um, processes. And then, obviously, the time is finite. So you should be uh, leveraging codes. Uh, I mean, yeah. de de delegating all the code in your team and then forgetting about that and relying on them to make the best decisions in terms of technical decisions, low level exactly. decisions. Exactly. Yeah. So it's about communicating that proportion of time. From now on, you'll be spending you know thirty percent leading, seventy percent coding, and so on and, and so on. Uh, that is clear to me. And, and thank you, you know, for this exhaustive answer. Uh, David is also saying thanks for the answer. Uh, no problem, David. You got any more? Just send them our way. I have another question coming in. It is related to something that was said, I think, a few minutes ago. Uh, so if you need additional context for it, we can ask for it. But Miwos is saying. Hello, Alvaro. What is a large scale project for you? And how do you judge if something is large scale or not? So my question here would be, I mean, we must have mentioned large scale projects sometime, but in relation to what though? And you know, how does this relate to for you to, to the subject? I'm sure everyone here listening has been in a small projects and large scale projects. Mm -hmm. Large scale project is something that can really disrupt a company. It, may, it, it means something that is going to change the whole product. Or if it's not the product itself, it's the infrastructure. For example, migrating from monolith to the microservices is a large project. It's a, it's a point in time where every single company is transitioning, for example, from MVP to, the, to a more elaborated product that can grow sure. seamlessly and can sure. scale. That moment in time, all the companies are facing it in the, in the early stages. That's a large project. Right. Migrating to microservices is a large project. Migrating a database from uh, on-premises to, I don't know, a cloud-based system is a large project. OK. So I feel tempted to kind of relate this back to our subject at hand. Niwosh, if you have a follow-up, by all means, uh, shoot it our way. I feel tempted to relate it back to our subject at hand in the sense of how does tackling large-scale projects change as your team scales? So we were talking about this transformation, you know, for example, when we were promoting this, uh, from a hands-on CTO to a leader of leaders or manager of managers. So how do you tackle our large-scale scale project when you're hands-on versus when you're managing managers? Can you paint us a picture here? At that point, you will be more or less like um, envisioning the whole process, so planning from a high level, more like components. Mm. Mm -hmm. And then you will need to rely on your team to refine that, that, that estimation. You will need to refine and you will get the blind spots because they are, they are on the inside. They, they, they right. are there. 
and you will you will need to get that information so you can then refine you can find spots that were uh, overlooked you will estimate a bit better and they will really tell you the feasibility or not on that so it's more about planning the capacity it's more about mm -hmm. uh, estimating the time and resources needed when you are leading leaders at that position you will have more responsibility on uh, saying yes no to the project or how it can be done because okay. most of the times it's like it has to be a yes right so it's, it's about finding the way to make it happen so bringing real feedback about okay this obviously can happen everything can happen and it's going to happen with this amount of time this amount of money this amount of people and we will say no to this this and these things because mm. this one is more priority so I think is is this high level what is expected from a leader of leaders? I see. So if that would is that if that's what's expected of me as a leader of leaders, which decisions am I leaving to my team? Which decisions am I, am I leaving to my middle middle management layer? What am I delegating here? The technical decisions. This depends on the kind of leadership style, but uh, I love to rely on my team to recognize them as the real experts on the on the matter. So when it's this kind of uh, large, scale pro large scale project, or even if, it, if it's small, they have the full ownership. So it's like a blank sheet. We want mm -hmm. to do this because of this goal of the company, because why? Why we are creating that? Why we are evolving that? Because of we are going to be more efficient, because mm -hmm. we are going to, to, to handle uh twice as customers as we are doing today Be whatever is the business reasons this is the translation i do so I, I i get the business knowledge why this is going to happen then i transmit it and then it's like hey in terms of technical way we have these kind of boundaries so you said the mm -hmm. boundaries but i make sure that the boundaries are big enough so they say they see a blank sheet they don't see the limits of the sheet but they see a blank sheet where they can paint and draw their own ideas. Okay. So I want them to take the full ownership. So if they need it, I can bring my own knowledge and expertise to say, okay, from a systems design point of view, I would use, I would use Redis or um, I would use Mencatch or I would use Elastic for this part or I would use uh, instances or I would go with a full Kubernetes setup mm -hmm. because have you thought about the timing we have? Because have you thought that for this project the budget is a bit tight why don't mm -hmm. we go with a more simpler solution we scale over time so doing this kind of sessions with them where they have the full ownership to 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 decide and my role there is more like a facilitator and trying to convey the the answers to something that uh is something as well uh practical and feasible for me so okay. conducting with questions conducting to the right point because maybe for their solutions, they are overlooking business concepts that I that I know right. or maybe I am trained off and they, and they don't. So with the right questions, they can finally understand my, the, the whole context and then they can bring the best technical decision according to the context, which is what an engineer is required. This compromise okay. between and trade off between the final quality and the results and the, the uh, or the, the resources involved, right? So having this having this, uh, this this balance maybe they are going for the best technical solution all the time right and right. When, once once you bring the context then it's moving more to the middle this is more or less my role in that in that case so your input what i'm hearing is part of your input is also giving them great questions that stimulate their thinking in the way of okay so maybe sometimes the best technical solution is actually not the best from a business point of view because it's too expensive or too labor intensive. Exactly, exactly. Okay. And they, they need to know it. So this way, mm -hmm. with every single meeting, you are training them in those really essential capabilities, which is soft skills, for example, asking great questions. We are teaching them yeah. how to ask great questions to their teams. Um, yeah. Spending the time with them is kind of mentoring there. You are developing kind of business context. So they understand the next time they need to make a decision, Mm -hmm. they will bring that context into account they will not think only about tech so this involves that every single meeting will be larger related to decisions for for new projects for example but this is what pays off 
And this is one of my recommendations. That's why you can deliver it, uh, you can deliver this leadership in every single touch point with your team if you need it. But okay. involves that you invest a bit more time on that. But instead of, I don't know, a full workshop of eight hours of the whole team just focusing on um, conflict resolution, you are delivering one step at a time. Mm -hmm. You involve them in a, in a decision for a technical solution. You involve them in the hiring process. They are there to decide if the next teammate is valid or not from a cultural perspective, not only from the technical perspective. So you are involving them in the, in the different areas. So they start to develop this kind of uh, 360 view of the role and, and how tech fits with the rest of the department. Right. Okay. Yeah, th that is all great. And I like this approach of, you know, giving this leadership advice piece by piece, this, this input that slowly lets them grow. And then they start asking themselves the questions that you would be usually asking and you can see them grow. That is a, a great picture to me. I'm tempted to go a little bit deeper into the subject of culture. Because one thing that I know, you know, when we were defining what a great, uh, you know, this, a great representative of this middle management layer is, is that they also keep the company culture intact. So, you know, as a person who is at the top, you know, above this middle management layer, is there something special that you can do or some steps that you can take here to make sure that your middle management layer can keep this culture? You can trust them to instill this culture into your next hires into the lower level. Lead by example. Oh. Leave the values every single day with every single action. If you think about your five, six, seven values of the company, in every single decision you make and you remain accountable against the culture and the values and not only about the results delivered by the team in terms of the product or the, mm -hmm. uh, the technical excellence, then your team will start imitating. You, you are setting the example. You cannot request that the culture is spreaded. What you can do is like, hey, this is the way I behave. This is what I believe that has to be done. I see. This is what I expect from you to deliver to the team. Otherwise, this will not this will not happen. But we need the developers to leave the values. We need the the the, the team leads to leave the values. Scrum masters, uh, agile coach, product owners, everyone should leave the values. And then you are the representative. You have the potential to impact the whole company or destroy it, just because of every single behavior you deliver into the company. From saying hi when you got to the office or start your, your, your day in Slack, to be punctual, to be supporting whenever someone has, uh, has a question, has a doubt, to preparing great onboarding sessions for the newcomers, to be proactive, to be innovative and, and, and using your time as well to to get uh, fresh ideas from the market, new business trends, new new tech trends, that's on your role. And right. the company should support, and you as an executive, as, as the top level, you should encourage the company, if they are not doing it, to evaluate the culture and the values, how they are living them, as well for, for example, the bonus, or taking this into the cultural fit the very first day you are you are hiring someone, you are meeting someone, the first thing, the cultural fit, no matter about the technical, let's go for the cultural fit. These are some things that you can put in place to ensure that the culture is really breathed every single day mm. and they are acting according to the company values and they live them, they respect them, they love them. They do it because they want, they feel, it, they feel identified by those values. It's not something that is forced, mm. right? Yeah, they think, what will my leader do in this situation, even if my leader isn't there, and then they act accordingly. So this example, it's it, what you said really speaks to the to the burden of leadership. And, you know, personally, I, I'm in marketing, but I am a team lead, too. And I think it applies more broadly what you said, you know, how you say hi, how you have every conversation, every interaction. It's a lot to think about, but it's really re rewarding when you see people growing in that direction when they start absorbing this culture. So, you know, thank you for, yeah. for saying all of that. I just that wanted part, to, sorry. No, no, that, that, that part is essential and doesn't matter if it's tech or not tech, but at the end, 
Um, you have mentioned culture is what everyone does when you are not watching. Yeah, that's culture. It's the normal behavior of the company because every single action, one second, two second, one hour, 24 hours, one week, one year of one person, two person, 10, 100, 100 people is what defines the culture of the company and is what cannot be copied. Anything else can be copied. That part cannot be copied. I see. So if they are managing managers and they are leading teams and you are not leading that team anymore, you need to be very strict about what is accepted and what is not. So you need to be the first setting the example. You can, mm. uh, as, as well as you do what the value says, you cannot do anything that is opposite to the values. Not every single one. Because then this will set the norm. And then the exception okay. becomes the norm. And that's terrible. So if it's about being innovative, you need to be the first one demonstrating mm -hmm. the team that you are innovative. And then you will be on your right to tell the team, hey, it's your responsibility to make everyone here live the values as much as you are doing. Right. That's yeah. your responsibility on the role. And then is when it starts permeating into the, the whole the whole company. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And thanks for this. Uh, really great point, if I do say so myself. Uh, look, watchers and listeners, uh, you know, everybody joining us here, this will be like the second to last moment to ask questions. So if there's anything about what we said that is piquing your curiosity, please, by all means, uh, leave a question and we'll be happy to answer. I have one more question that's a little bit of a different subject because we were talking a lot about, you know, elevating these leaders, scaling, you know, making sure that this, uh, this layer is uh, formed, this middle management layer. And as I was saying, this another question came in, so let's just go into that. Yes, negotiation, uh, yeah. Negotiation, let me see. Let me read yes. the question first then for the people potentially listening to this. A tech lead sits between the tech world and the non-tech top management. Do you have any tip in how to bridge this gap? Should I read the second one or do you want to answer this one uh, first? Yeah, I can answer this one. The second one is the one I was mentioning as negotiation. We can go for that later. Right okay, now, sure. exactly. The tech lead, it's the one that is between tech and business and all the rest of the areas, right? In order to bridge this gap, for me, the most important part is business skills. The, mm. the thing that we have been talking about. From a tech perspective, you need to start being on an upper level, on a level where you oversee all the technology, how backend interacts with front-end data, um, infrastructure, AI, machine learning. All the components are just components in a, in a, in a system, right? So if you are a backend developer, you'd better start training this uh, systems design. There are plenty of resources out there to understand how everything fits together and start doing business cases about, hey, if I want to develop a fully fledged chat solution, for example, for 100,000 customers per day, what should I take into account? And start from scratch. Doing this kind of exercises will develop your, your, your um, high level tech vision Right. And then on the other side, business vision is a hey, how tech and product interact with the rest of the department. So how we can take their priorities and their emergencies into account. And um, in order to bridge that gap, it's also about getting more into business. So trying to create, for example, project from scratch. Uh, we, we did a, a workshop a month ago about that. So it was like, hey, think on the customer. Start understanding what are the customer needs what a company needs to deliver to really solve customer pains. Right. And which is the process that the company follows to go from the idea that that solution can solve a problem of a real customer in the market to the real implementation, which are the steps which, uh, you are, you are uh, touching, right? So in this case, I would say uh, we can share the link as well. But uh, in this case, if you look for uh, Lean Startup, this, this philosophy, this methodology, can help you to broaden your vision and see how tech fits in a more yeah. um, bigger um, environment, right? Yeah, yeah. Lean Startup, not the first time this concept is uh, mentioned on our show. I think it definitely applies here. Hope that answers the question. We might go into more detail, but we still have this other one in the queue. So let's go into that. 
So this next one, you mentioned it's about negotiation. Let me read it out loud. How can a tech lead express the need of the big tech implementations that will not translate into revenue? Interesting what you're going to say about that. Yes. A, we need half of the team for the next six months in a row because we need to transition from the monolith to microservices. And then the CEO is going to say, what the hell? Um, no way. We need to develop this and we need to launch the product in this market. We are going to have this strategic partnership with this big brand that will uh, bring a lot of revenue. End of conversation if you are blocked because of this kind of question. Sure. Otherwise, you can say, okay, look, you have two options. Three, actually. You do it now. You do it later. You don't do it. If you don't do it, the company will be destroyed in one year. If you do it later, you are going to spend twice or three times as much time, effort, and resources, money, okay, money, in doing mm -hmm. that, if you do it after this big partnership is coming. Because we will need to develop a lot of things for this big partnership or for this product launch or for adapting the product to the new market. And then what you will need to migrate is not this, is this. So you choose, you choose. But why you are not taking tech into account for this kind of big project critical decisions? We need to be aware of the business roadmap, product roadmap. So you as a manager or, or the top level manager, in this case, the CTO, should be aware of that. And is the one that has to be there to be strict and say no when it's needed to say no. Or at least to let them choose the solution. Because maybe that big partnership cannot wait and it's really important and strategic. And then it's like, OK, this is a trade off. Mm -hmm. We don't do it now. I'm just here to make you aware that this needs to happen, this transition to microservices. We don't do it now. But as soon as this strategic partnership is done, we are not committing any other product development. We are going to do that. And you need to be aware that at that point in time, maybe six months according to the timelines, at that point in time, we will be spending at least 60% more to make it happen. Right. Yeah. So, so the main difference that I see here is, you know, you can talk about monolith versus microservices. You can talk about, you know, the technical layer of it. But in this other example, you started talking in terms that the CEO actually cares about, right? If you don't do this, okay. your company will fail. Obviously, I care about my company not exactly. failing. And yes, like, like you just gestured, money, right? If we don't do this now, we're going to pay three times as much later. And that, I believe, can get through. You know, obviously exactly. you would have to provide some additional arguments as to why this is so, but that's, you know, it's a longer conversation here. Yeah. And, and, and speaking of which, we're basically almost out of time uh, for this session. David, thank for, thanks for the question. Hope that answers it, you know, in a, in a good way. And yeah, I mean, <laughs> this time went by so fast. So, you know, there might be a, well, like one additional question, let's see, but, you know, in the meantime, any announcements for our audience? You know, you've been a great guest. You've mentioned leader to some extent. Maybe there's something that you want to, you know, put out there in the world for everybody watching and listening. Something they should visit. Something they should check out. I should stop talking. You should, <laughs> you should make yes. your announcements. So, um, what I wanted to offer here, um, we, we are offering now until the the twentieth of May. We were offering. 20% uh, discount on all our courses and workshops because it was the official launch of our Leader Academy to, mm. to do these kind of workshops and you are training your time, your team step by step, right? And you can you can leverage this learning and development partnership. Um, and in this case, what we can do is extend it uh, for the next uh, one month, for example, because we have a code for you guys. Um, and in this case, if when you apply, it's a, it's a, um, a waiting list. We are going to open new new seats for uh, for the final quarter of the year after summer. And if you use the code that we will that we will share, which in this case is uh, Tech Leaders Hub, then you introduce that code into the form to apply, and then we will give you the twenty percent discount, no matter if you you do it now or in one month. So okay, until the, the today is eighteenth, we can we can extend the offer to the eighteenth of June, and in case. You you appear there and you apply. We will we will apply this discount. Excellent. So the code is Tech Leaders Hub, just like the name of our show. Exactly. exactly.
Okay, great, great. So if you want to use you know, the Leader Academy workshops, I reviewed them myself. The topics sound all very, very interesting. Uh, is there anyone that's like your particular favorite that you want to you know, <laughs> promote here or anything like that? Not, not a particular one, but we are starting next week the, the first one actually with Michelle Kaiser oh. and the WaveUp team, which is it's about culture. It's all about what we have been discussing, how to develop that culture in the team. So they get the ownership, you make the right decisions, you lead by example. So you develop this kind of mindset, this kind of attitude and behavior that you would love to have in your team for everyone. Okay. Right. So we will do it in a couple of in a couple of days, Tuesday and Thursday. So it's really quick, six hours. Um, and we will do it next week. So uh, still some seats uh, remaining. That's so you can make use of this code really, really soon. That's all great. You know, from our side, if in case this somebody is meeting STX next uh, for the first time here, just in case you were wondering what we do is we build software for various types of uh, companies uh, and we can do anything really. We can do end to end development. If you want to build a product, if you have just an idea, we can help you discover it, define it, design it, develop it and then deliver it. I always get anxious that I'm going to get the order wrong. <laughs> Uh, if you just need, you know, more capacity, if you fe you're feeling overwhelmed with your goals, we can provide additional capacity as well. And our main thing is Python. If you're coding in Python, if you want to speed up your projects, the best thing to do, at least from my super biased perspective, is to go to stxnext.com and to click hire us and let them know Tech Leaders Hub sent you. That's going to look very good on my KPIs sheet. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, at the end of the quarter. Uh, but anyway, this has been super fun, Alvaro. Thank you, Alvaro. Thank you for the time here. And, you know, it's just really looking forward to doing something uh, together again. Thank you so much for this opportunity. It was it was amazing to, to discuss in this kind of uh, informal and relaxed environment. And thank you, everyone, that was asking, because at the end, you are leading the conversation. The most relevant content is the one you request. So much, much better than imagining which are the, the questions that we can deliver is that you ask your own, ask your own questions, concerns, doubts, and, and you have done it. So thank you, thank you so much for your commitment with this workshop. I hope exactly, yeah. it was useful. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for attending. Don't forget to follow SDX next. Uh, don't forget to follow Alvaro for more content from him. And we will see you here hopefully next time. Really looking forward to it. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> OK, thanks, everyone. Bye.